Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're studying the Sabbath School lessons prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this is a study of the lessons for the third quarter of 2012. In this quarter, we are studying First and Second Thessalonians, and this is lesson number seven in that series entitled Living Holy Lives. It covers a, the section of Thessalonians in First Thessalonians 4, verses 1 to 12. So we would really encourage you to get out your Bible and look at those, those sec that section of Scripture with us. But to begin, let's offer a word of prayer. If you'll bow your head with us. Our loving Father, we thank you for this privilege to talk about your word, to think about what might have been happening, what might have inspired the writing of this portion of Scripture by your friend Paul. Help us to correctly interpret what we read here as we share it with others is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Living holy lives. How, how good a job do you think we do at living holy lives? Well, I, I can speak for everyone mm -hmm. because I know humanity, but uh, as for myself, I don't do a very good job. Do you think if, truly holy. Do you think if we were truly living holy lives, we would still be here? No. No. No, we would be good. Almost certainly we would not be here. So this lesson will focus, us on, focus on some of the challenges that face Adventists in the 21st century. Challenges of living a holy and pure life in a largely immoral and sexually explicit generation. Now, let's try to paint the picture here as clearly as we can. God made us male and female the way we are. Uh, Ellen White comments about that in, in a very interesting statement found originally in, well, yeah, originally in Review and Herald, February 11, 1902, the first paragraph in that article. All heaven took a deep and joyful interest in the creation of the world and of man. Human beings were a new and distinct order. They were made in the image of God. Does that mean the angels are not in the image of God? What does that imply? And it was the Creator's design that they should populate the earth. Is that what makes us more in the image of God than angels? They were to live in close communion with heaven, receiving power from the source of all power, upheld by God. They were to live sinless lives. Sinless lives. You can find that in Volume 1 of the Bible Commentary, page 1081, paragraph 3. Uh, as an easier place to locate it. So the question, the big question, why did God invent sex? I, I thought it said so, to populate the earth. Reason. Okay, is that the only reason? Also to provide intimacy between a husband and a wife <clears throat> okay. so that they could feel the oneness as we're supposed to be one with God. Okay. Well, I mean, it's very. Yeah. I think there's more to it than that. Mm -hmm. In in the business of populating the earth, that means you have children, mm -hmm. and this was a model that would test parents. Mm -hmm. And I, I think they were humanity was to derive a little bit of the problems that God dealt with as they dealt with their family problems. So true. I am I am fully convinced that God made us male and female so we can struggle with the problem of trying to live with somebody who doesn't see things exactly the way we do. Yeah. That's on one level. The other is to, about the parent-child relationship, yeah. which is the creator and his kids. Mm -hmm. And God is, and he's referred to as a father, which means mm -hmm. implies a, a parent-child relationship. Yeah. And the one duty the parent has is to train his kids, her kids. Well, uh, so in other yeah. words, in our world, Instead of creating a billion angels or a billion people, if he wanted to populate this earth, he made two. Right. And he said, okay, the rest is up to you. But this was done post-sin in heaven. Yes. Well, be we, we, you need to spell that out. Some of our people, listeners, might not understand exactly what you mean by that. There had been some charges leveled against, against God. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you look at what those charges were, then this was a genius method of demonstrating those charges to be wrong. Risky, but genius. Right. 
Okay. Well, yeah, where do we find those charges? And what were those charges? Well, I think the easiest one is in the, in the story of the Eve and at the tree. And the creature in the tree says, did God tell you not to eat of this stuff? He's a liar mm -hmm. because you won't. So the first charge is that God can't be trusted. He's a liar. And as you read more in various places, you can find others. And I think for Seventh-day Adventists, those who appreciate the writings of Ellen White, it's spelled out in detail in, in three locations, well, really two locations, uh, in the first chapters of the book Patriarchs and Prophets and the first section of volume one of what we, what we call the Spirit of Prophecy, uh, which is now published in, in facsimile format from the 1880s. And there's some very, very interesting information there about what happened before this earth was created. I believe on your website, <coughs> www.theox.org, there's also a handout that mm -hmm. says the great controversy in scripture. It's about mm -hmm. three the pages of, of small type. Yeah. Oh, in scripture. You're talking about the one yes. in scripture, yes. In scripture. Yes. And also Ellen White quotes. Yeah. So um, <coughs> that raises some other questions. If we are a new and distinct order, and one of the main reasons why we're a new and distinct order is so that we can recreate and repopulate the earth, um, why did Jesus say what he did in Matthew 22, verse 30? Look at that real quick. Matthew 22, verse 30. For when the dead rise to life, they will be like the angels in heaven and will not marry. So is this um, bisexuality thing, is that a temporary measure? And it's going to disappear at the second coming and it will, there will, it will never happen again. I think we're going to have to wait and find out for sure. Wait and find out for sure, huh? Well, a friend, I believe it was Dr. Neese, once mm -hmm. said that God has never taken away things that were good that he gave. He gave marriage in the, at the Garden of Eden seems unlikely that he'll take that away. Uh, Dr. Neese also asked some questions, some probing questions. He said, do you think that, I mean, he said, and I said, speaking about his wife, he said, w the difference between me and my wife, considerable amount of that difference is because of our sexuality. She is a female and I'm a male. It doesn't mean that when we get to heaven, I'm going to say, are you, let's see, were you my wife or you were the plumber? You know, is, is we gonna, are we going to forget all aspects of that? I mean, these are questions which people could raise. If there had been no sin in God's perfect world, would there have ever been our, our, our race? Perfect universe. You in mean, a or perfect, perfect universe, perfect in a perfect heaven. heaven. I mean, if, I don't know that this is a good thing. It may be the best thing in a bad environment. A few seconds ago, Ken said uh, about uh, creating this earth and uh, male and female was risky. Mm -hmm. Well, love, if you're going to have choice, there must be some risk involved and there's consequences to making a choice. Mm -hmm. And that choice is either to live in harmony with the Creator or to choose to attempt to live outside of harmony, which is ultimately death. So, I mean, the, you, there's not a whole lot of uh, well, grayscale there. See, here's, 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 my, here's my challenge for you. We believe that God is love. The Bible says so in, in multiple places, especially uh, 1 John 4, 8, 16. There's very, just so many words. How are we supposed to learn love? I mean, if we're supposed to become like God, there must be a setting in which we're supposed to learn about love. Which kind of love are you speaking of? There are different types. Well, let's right now focus on what the Bible talks about most of all, and that would be the, the agape love. This would be the, the, un, the principal love that means that you, you extend yourself, you do things for other, other human beings, be it your wife, be it your husband, be it your children, that you wouldn't normally do if you, know, if you didn't love them. I don't know how many eons the creation and unfallen worlds were before this earth came into mm -hmm. position. But somehow they managed to learn about love mm -hmm. without this relationship. Good question. Did they, do they have special 
interpersonal relationships I that we don't know about? I don't, I don't know. No. I don't think so. Well, if, if, if they have not, something not, like this, then we're not sexual, unique. Not <laughs> they had to relations. have this earth experience, observe this earth experience in order to fulfill, to expand their understanding about God. They, right. they, yeah. they, it's, uh, the infinite one has to communicate to finite creatures, and everything God creates is finite, and he has to do it through finite beings. There is no, uh, we as finite beings can't conceptualize of a, of a substitute for finite. It's interesting that in the Bible, we don't, we, we completely miss this in English. But in the Bible, in the Old Testament, about half of the names for God are in, are in the female gender. Now, I don't know what all the reasons are for that. I can only speculate. But I do know that God intends for us to learn more about Him through the marriage relationship. So, and it seems clear, Ellen White spells this out quite well, it seems clear that it, it's God's intention that women should learn more about the male characteristics that they got from God, from their husbands, and husbands should learn more of the female characteristics of God that, that they got from God. And so, I, I really honestly believe that this was intended to be the challenge for us to learn to live with somebody else that we don't, we never have completely figured out, uh, we, but we, we learn how to get along with them usually, somehow or other. Seems to be, I don't know, it seems to be it's like it's happening less and less. When I, when I tell people that I've been married for 45 years and my, my parents have been married almost 70 years, they go, wow. You know, like, how could that be? You know, a person could actually stay married to one person for that long? Whoa! But, uh, you know, isn't that what God intended? Um, yes. And, and, and why did He do it that way? Well, well I, because we had lost our divine human connection. Mm -hmm. Adam sacrificed that for us. And so given the, the disconnect with divinity, mm -hmm. what other mechanism could he come up with that might teach some of this? I, I don't know. I'm okay. just Fair enough. guessing. Well, there's one thing I think is perfectly clear, and this would be the main, probably the main subject of our, of our discussion this evening. If God produced something that was really intended to teach us about Him, then you got to believe that Satan is going to be in there doing everything he possibly can to mess it up. That's for sure. He is going to be determined. He's going to, I mean, and, and you know, there's another interesting thing about this that, that I think we need to be honest about, and that's that we as human beings have the capacity to procreate. The devil doesn't. We can do something that the devil can't. And he is green as envy. You know? He's just as green as you can be about that particular subject. Because remember, if you, if you know the story about what happened back before Earth was created, one of the arguments that, that Satan claimed was, you know, I want to be able to help in the creative process. And God says, you have nothing to contribute. And he says, I want to be a part of it. And God says, you have nothing to contribute. And end, that ended up in a war in which Satan and his followers were thrown out of heaven because he can't do even the little bit that we can do. As the only female here, I yeah. would like to <laughs> mention one I'm thing. sorry, that... No, but the model of marriage from mm -hmm. the beginning of time to now has not been really fair to women. Mm -hmm because even with Abraham, when the women could not have children, they went to a concubine, they went to their slave. They went, it has not been, it's been a, a m many parts of that model has been uh, constructed by men. And women have, be, have gotten the short end of the stick. Quite yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, this is true. We, through scriptures and through most of this world's history, there have, most of the societies have been 
uh, patriarchal or patristic societies. There are a few matriarchal societies. There's some in Africa, there's some in Asia, but most of them are, are, are patriarchal societies. And that means that the, you know, the inheritance is passed down through, you know, officially it's passed down through the father to the son, et cetera. Um, well, another part of the background for us helping us to understand this passage in 1 Thessalonians is, of course, the story of Paul. Paul's home church was Antioch in Syria. The church he spent probably in the next amount of time at was Ephesus. The third church he spent that the third amount of time at was Corinth. All three of these churches had either directly within them or very just a short distance outside of the, of, of the city itself, a major yeah, I didn't know what to call these things. Religious establishments, temples, and so forth, that basically were, were not much more than brothels. They were sexual establishments where people would go out there, they would get drunk, they carried out all this kind of stuff. There were both male and female prostitutes out there. And, I mean, you go to Corinth, for example, and there was this huge temple on the plateau above the city. And according to the ancient scribes, a thousand temple, pro, uh, temple virgins stayed in this place, and every afternoon about four o'clock they would descend on the city of Corinth. You know, I, that may have been part of the reason why Paul, when he first arrived at Corinth, said, you know, I'm, I'm not sure there's any good I can do in this place. And Paul, God says, no, there, I have a lot of people here. You need to, you need to stick around. And it was, a, it, was a, it was a port city. You know, port cities have a reputation people coming and going. Ephesus, too, was a port yeah. city, and yeah. when Antioch. my wife and I visited there, we were directed to the Temple of Diana, Temple mm -hmm. to Diana, and then over here is the city. The temple was down near where the river was, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. port. Exactly. And Diana was a, a very... Uh, Easy lady. What? <laughs> Busy, busy lady. Busy <laughs> yeah, lady. Yeah, busy lady. Um, trying to nourish, nourish the whole world with her <laughs> milk supply, I guess. Well, so all of that needs to be kept in background as we think of 1 Thessalonians. And let's, let's turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and I'm going to read some of the verses and we'll work our way through here. Finally, our brothers and sisters, and now we, we, need, to, we need to think about this. In the first three chapters, of First Thessalonians, Paul has focused primarily on the past, on his, his interactions with the Thessalonians when he came and what happened and what happened right after he left and all, that, all the details of the, the personal history. Now all of a sudden Paul is going to say, okay, I need to talk to you about the future. And so he now is going to talk in chapters 4 and 5 He's going to talk about some things that he thinks they need to change, some things they need to be aware of. He's going to talk about what's going to happen in the future. So we have finally our brothers and sisters. You learned from us how you should live in order to please God. This is, of course, how you have been living. You know, you're all saints, right? And now we beg and urge you in the name of the Lord Jesus to do even more. For you know the instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. God wants you to be holy and completely free from sexual immorality. So that's how he starts out. Where do you think he's going to go next? Well, one of the things he does is, is he, 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 you know, Paul's, Paul's constantly thinking how he's going to put everything together. Notice that back in the verses right before we, where we started reading, back at the end of chapter 3, and remember there, there were no chapters no verses in, in Paul's letter. It was one continuous letter. So we go back to the previous paragraph. May our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus prepare the way for us to come to you. See, he's saying, I'm, I'm really hoping we can, we can get back together. May the Lord make your love for one another and for all people grow more and more. And down there we just said that, you know, he repeated that idea. And become as great as our love for you. And this way he will strengthen you and you will be perfect and holy. We already mentioned that in the, pre, in the following paragraph. In the presence of our God and Lord, Father, when our Lord Jesus comes with all who belong to him. And we're going to see that all those, those three or four major ideas <laughs> are repeated here in the 
first verses of chapter 4. So, um, in his later correspondence, Paul specifically stated that they should avoid sexual immorality. We've already mentioned that a couple of times. Any other sin, he said in first, to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 6, any other sin a man commits does not affect his body, but the man who is guilty of sexual immorality sins against his own body. What do you think he was... Is he talking about uh, sexually transmitted infections here? Or what do you think he's talking about there? I would think so. I, even, mm -hmm. Especially in a time where they, they had no antibiotics. Right. They had, you know, they must have went through some... And some places, they just went places and had orgies nonstop. It was the pastime. And that's what they did. But the one thing, again, I keep coming to that because the, they always talk about the women. Everyone say, oh, Mary Magdalene was a prostitute and somebody got stoned. Well, well, well nothing happened to the male. Mm -hmm. And if it were, you know, for to have, uh, you need demand and supply. If it were not for the demand, there wouldn't be, you know. But the male were never looked upon the same way. For, like Father Augustine, he agreed that he had problem. Today he would be called a sexual addict. Mm -hmm. But he asked God, please give me chastity, but please not yet. Mm -hmm. You know, that was it. Yeah. Good. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah this, is, this is very true. Yeah, N no argument about that. But if you go back and look carefully at what it's, the instructions from Moses, that God gave to Moses, he said, when that woman was arrested, it very clearly says, Two things. One, that the husband is the one who's supposed to bring her to court if he thinks she's misbehaving, not the, not the pastors, if you want to call them that. Number one. And number two, both parties were supposed to be brought, not just the woman. And if you claimed in, in, in John, the Gospel of John chapter 8 there, if you claim that this woman was caught in the very act, it would be a little hard to suggest that you didn't see the partner. It would be. <laughs> In fact, the partner was there. Yeah, he might have even been part of the escorting committee. Mm -hmm. Well, clearly God's intention was for one man to be married to one woman and for them to be in a very close and meaningful relationship. That was to be the closest and most intimate relationship known to human beings. This close relationship was to be a part of the love that would form the perfect environment into which children would be born and grow up and where the children were supposed to learn about love, right? Well, Paul specifically mentions an interesting thing in verses 1 and 15 of this chapter 4. He says, Finally, our brothers and sisters, you learned from us, we just read this, how, how you should live in order to please Jesus. This is, of course, how you have been living, and now we beg and urge for you in the name of the Lord Jesus to do even more. For you know the instructions, I should have included word verse 2 here, for you know the instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. What would he mean by saying the authority of the Lord Jesus? Well, he was, he's trying to express this is not from me. Yeah. This is from the Lord. Okay. Drop, drop down to verse 15. Peterson says this, you know the guidelines that we laid out for you from the Master Jesus. Yeah. Verse 15 says, What we are teaching you now is the Lord's teaching. We who are alive and on the day that the Lord comes will not go ahead of those who have died. The Lord's teaching? Where did he find out about this Lord's teaching? Many. Which was the very first book of the New Testament to be written? First this one. Is. Probably this one. So where did he? He wasn't a disciple. How did he find out about what the Lord's teaching was? Word of mouth. As the stories were told. Do you in believe the, everything the that goes around? All the rumors? Well, not the rumors, but you know, when you're in a, a setting where you're there to learn, uh -huh. and people who were eyewitnesses are there, and yeah. they're telling, we, we have to believe them. I mean, that's part of our faith. And, yeah. and then we can judge them, we can check that's to make sure they're telling yeah. the truth. But None of the Gospels have been written yet. Yeah, but, but they can talk to, talk to the people who were there. Okay. No, but Paul said the gospel I teach you, I did not get from men. Mm -hmm. I got directly from Christ. 
I did not uh, go and cons and talk with the uh, ones that were apostle before me. So he's saying what he knows, he knows because c Jesus himself pulled it in his heart. And also because Paul, you know, Paul was a, a student and a teacher of the law. Mm -hmm. He would clearly know that it was said several times in the Old Testament mm -hmm. about when the Lord would come, how it would be. Mm -hmm. For example, in the book of Daniel and other places, at the last trumpet mm -hmm. would be the coming of the Lord. This is how he would come. Mm -hmm. And at that time, the dead would be raised up to inherit, you know, to their inheritance, to receive okay. their inheritance. So what we are suggesting is that Paul had some other sources of information which we don't have available to us right now. Yeah. That raises lots of interesting speculation about the inspiration of Scripture, how it took place, how all these things were written. Uh, this is a letter. I mean, how, what would you know? What would you think if, if you were writing a letter to my, your friends and all of a sudden an angel showed up and said, you know, people are going to be reading your letter 2,000 years from now as the Word of God? I doubt that that was on his mind. I think he was writing to those people. Mm -hmm. Turns out that what he said, the principles that he was teaching, the people to whom it was read, hung on to those, discovered that they were very good principles mm -hmm. to live by, and passed them on down to us. Well, of course, the scholars, the, the, particularly the critical scholars, are going to say, okay, but what were his sources? Well, we're not, we're not privileged to that. Yeah. We can tweak all we want, we can surmise, but we don't have the data. Yeah. You have private evidence. <laughs> private Certainly evidence. some of his uh, things that he went for was the Old Testament scriptures. Sure. Because that statement in uh, chapter 4, verse 15 is not contrary to the Old Testament. No. The question is whether it's contrary. The question is where did Paul get it from? And, and some, some, some critics would say, um, and, and maybe rightfully so, I, I don't have a problem with this, that there may have been written things, written down things, l histories of the life of Christ, that were available in Paul's day that we don't have anymore. Guess Possibly. on, yeah. rave on. Yeah. Well, several of the, the Matthew, Mark, Luke are so similar in many respects, the wording and so on, and some have uh -huh. this have all stories together, some have an individual story separately, um, that many have speculated, well, authorities, Bible scholars have speculated that there's a source document, quelle, mm -hmm. I think they call it a document Q or something of that sort. Well, and, and the answer, to the story behind that, just very quickly, is that 90% of Mark is copied in either Matthew or Luke. But Matthew and Luke are quite a bit larger than Mark is, both of them are, and there's a significant portion of the, the remainder uh, that of those two books that is, is apparently from a common source, but not from Mark. So they speculate there must be another source that Matthew and, and Luke were looking at in addition to what they got out of Mark. So it's... So, anyway. uh, I mean, so. Yeah. So what? So well, maybe, maybe it, Paul had access to that also. Yeah. Perhaps. Yeah. Why would I, why would I, uh, no. why would that frustrate me? It, it, it's not a question of frustrating you. It's a question of understanding how our Bible came about to sort of keep our minds open to realize that, you know, it didn't sort of descend, you know, with the dew from, from heaven. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now let's look at verses 3 through 8. First Thessalonians 4, and I'm going to read verses 3 through 8. God wants you to be holy and completely free from sexual immorality. Each of you, men should know how to live with his wife in a holy and honorable way, not with a lustful desire like the heathen who do not know God. In this matter then, no man should do wrong to his fellow Christian or take advantage of him. We have told you this before and we strongly warned you that the Lord will punish those, those who, who do that. God did not call us to live in immorality but in holiness. So then, whoever rejects his teaching is not rejecting a human being, but God, who gives you his Holy Spirit. Paul felt pretty strongly about what he had to say, didn't he? 
Yes. Well, what, how do you, if you look at some, verse, some versions, it'll say God is the avenger. Yeah. Are you comfortable with God, a God who's an aven, avenger? RSV says an, an avenger. Mm -hmm. Depends upon what one means by avenger. Okay. What do you think we should mean by avenger? Is God waiting with a big stick up there ready to zap people who misbehave? No. There wouldn't be any of us left if he zapped everybody who got out of line, would there? Certainly we do not believe such a, that God would be like that. Is this possibly referring to the fact that in a day when there were no treatments for such things, sexually transmitted infections were God's way of punishing those practicing sexual morality? And, you know, there's pretty good evidence that some of the Caesars, for example, uh, deteriorated in the latter part of their lives, probably had tertiary syphilis. And their brains were just being eaten up by these infections. Or were those the natural consequences of such behavior if the partner had a sexually transmitted disease or infection? What's the difference? <laughs> yeah, what's the difference? Well, is God zapping us from misbehaving or are we just reaping the consequences of our own behavior? I think it's pretty much consequences, but it sure be easy to describe that when you credit everything good and bad to God to, to give him credit for that. Yeah. Credit or blame, whichever yeah. you call it. Pay your money, take your choice. Yeah. What's you call the, him the sorry? judge? In the, is, is a judgment there somewhere? Yeah. Yeah, What's the difference between getting in a fast car and driving really fast and getting a crash and getting your legs cut off than uh, going and doing so sexual impurity and have sexual disease? It's all uh, cause and effect. Mm -hmm. But we put s sort of taboo over sex that we're a little nervous about sex. Mm -hmm. And, and it make we, we put it in a different c uh, category. And I've been single for... Uh, I got divorced in 2012, mm -hmm. 2012, 2002. Uh, my, I've been single since for almost 12 years. Mm -hmm. And it's not easy. It changes you when you go to bed by yourself and wake up every day for a decade. And I had to do that because I had two small children. Mm -hmm. And when you hear everything about oh, what happens to children, and, uh, I was so terrified of anything happening to my children, I made a conscious decision to just focus on that. Mm -hmm. And I had no guarantee. And when they, my daughter turned 18, she did not do what I wanted her to do. She went and did something totally contrary to what I wanted. Yet, I did what I had to do, and I, but it changes you when you're alone all the time. But now it's not the time. We live in such perilous time. I have to make decisions. What do I do? Do I just get someone to have someone near me? Or do I concentrate on getting my children up? And it's, it's a difficult and it, time. Yeah. And it, this is just an example of the, good. the challenges that we face. And, and unfortunately, the difficulties that, that parents face, that children face when their parents divorce and so forth like this, that is such a part of our of our world today. Um, well, verses three and seven. Look at this. God wants same chapter. God wants you to be holy and completely free from sexual immorality. And then verse seven. God did not call us to live in immorality, but in holiness. What what's holiness? Christ-like. Isn't that set apart? Holiness, the, the Greek word hagios, means to be set aside for a special or sacred purpose. Mm -hmm. The word used in Thessalonians implies a process rather than an outcome. So you're not just, you know, set on a pedestal here as a, as, as a plaster saint. This is, this is an ongoing process of growing and becoming more and more like Jesus. Okay? Um, that is totally incompatible with a life of sexual immorality. The word he uses in these verses is porneia. And you can recognize some modern words that are related to that. The, this, that basically covers all forms of sexual immorality from what we call pornography all the way to prostitution and certainly would include most aspects of the fertility forms of worship as practiced in Paul's day. So it's, um, and it was forbidden. 
How are Christians supposed to maintain a healthy and holy attitude toward marriage and a sexual relationship in our day when sex is used almost indiscriminately and in public, in, and publicly, I might add, for advertising purposes, for example? I mean, you can't drive down the freeway, you can't open a newspaper, you can't open a magazine unless there's some, uh, you know, sexually imp imp implying advertisement or something of that nature. Even on the internet, if you go to look at a sermon, yeah. a preacher preaching on YouTube or some other channel like that site, you go there and they have these all kinds of ads surrounding that uh, ho something holy that you're looking for is, is surrounded by, I wouldn't say pornography, but pretty close. Yeah. Well, notice these words. We might think that, you know, things are really deteriorated in our day. Notice these words from the Roman pagan orator Cicero. You probably all heard the name. I don't know how much you know about him. These were his comments way back around about the time of Paul. If there's anyone who thinks that youth should be forbidden affairs, even with courtesans, he is doubtless eminently austere. You straight-laced, backward kind of people, right? But his view is contrary to, not only to the license of this age, but also to the customs and concessions of our ancestors. For when was this not a common practice? When was it blamed? When was it forbidden? I mean, you know. How degraded can you get? Yeah, everybody's doing it. So, I mean, <laughs> let's not pretend like this isn't something that everybody's doing, right? Not everybody's. And I might add, for Christians who take the Bible seriously, if everybody's doing it is a reason for doing something, then we're all going to join Satan's side at the end. That's right. Remember that he's going to conduct an evangelistic campaign like you wouldn't believe. The whole world is going to be wandering after him. Revelation 13. So we better not say, okay, everybody's doing it, that's fine. Include really, a clue to right and wrong. If the masses are going one direction, truth is po possibly in that direction. Very likely. It used to be our parents would tell us, you know, to be normal or something. Now, f definitely for sure, we do not want to be normal. <laughs> because normal is, a, there's a problem with normal now. Normal is not good now. <laughs> so we need to be set apart, set aside for God's purpose, holy. I don't have it right, but the, one of the quotations is that when we become as God would have us be, uh -huh. we will be regarded by the worldlings as odd, singular, straight-laced extremists. Yeah. Yeah. You peculiar people. That's right. Well, there's a, there's a very interesting verse that comes next in our study here. First Thessalonians 4, verse 4. Each of you men should know how to live with his wife in a holy and honorable way. Now, the, the Greek there is a little, in fact, my, I think my, my translation even has it here. Those words could be translated, live with his wife, or control his body. They could also mean that. It's a very interesting... Two maybe, maybe that's not so different? Maybe it's not so different, <laughs> yeah. Well, is Paul suggesting that each man should find himself a suitable wife? Look at 1 Peter 3, 7, where the same word is used. In the same way, you husbands must live with your wives with the proper understanding that they are weaker than you. Treat them with respect, because they also will receive, together with you, God's gift of life. Do this so that nothing will interfere with your prayers. Nothing will inter interfere with you. You're not going to let your wife interfere with your prayers, are you? Now, how, you know, very interesting words there. Once again, is this suggesting that sex should take place only in the context of a committed marriage relationship? I think absolutely. Mm. Yeah. But the people who were saying that were not following that. Yeah. And all, they were not following that. And in the same way, it, he's speaking almost like men are not supposed to be passionate toward their wives. But today it would sound like that, but then maybe because the women were like poverty, maybe they had no say in it. It was mm -hmm. just, okay, it, that's not respectful and that's not nice. No. Well, look at the next section, verses 6 to 8. In this matter, then, no man should do wrong to his fellow Christian or take advantage of him. We have told you this before and we strongly warn you 
that the Lord will punish those who do that. God will not call us to live, or God did not call us to live in immorality, but in holiness. So then whoever rejects this teaching is not rejecting a human being, but God who gives you His Holy Spirit. What does the gift of the Holy Spirit have to do with living moral lives? Well, while we all recognize that uh, contracting sexually transmitted infections is a serious problem, especially in some areas of the world where HIV AIDS is rampant, it is almost certainly true that the greatest damage done to a person by sexual promiscuity is the damage it does to his or her own mind and character. Sexual immorality involves not only how we are treating others, but also how we are treating Jesus Christ and even about how we treat ourselves. Right. Yeah. In other words, we are, we are making trash out of everything that God counts as worthwhile, as important, and, and as valuable. When we say, God, I, I don't need your help. You know, you remember the words from Jesus in Matthew 25, 34 to 30, 46. He just says, inasmuch as you've done it unto one of the least of these, you've done it unto me. For those of you who might find it useful, if you're having studying your Sabbath school class and would like to uh, use some of this material that we've been using here, uh, these handouts are available and, and some other materials about Thessalonians on our website at www.theox.org. Well, it should be noted that in Paul's world, sexual immorality was almost always connected with alcohol consumption, riotous living, and or- orgies. What do you think Paul was implying when he talked about living a holy life? Well, he goes on to expand a little bit. Look at 1 Thessalonians 4, 9 to 12. There is no need to write to you about love for your fellow believers. You yourselves have been taught by God how you should love one another. And you have, in fact, behaved like this towards all the brothers and sisters in all Macedonia. So we beg you, our brothers and sisters, to do even more. Now, I'd like to stop there for a second. Do you suppose it's possible that um, just as the early church in Jerusalem was living together in almost like a commune, they were sharing food, they were sharing property, they were, they were spending their time together, do you suppose the church in Thessalonica, Thessalonica was doing the same thing? But he goes on, huh? It might well, Luke. Yeah. In this way, you will win the respect of those who are not believers, and you will not have to depend on anyone for what you need. This call to love, Mm -hmm. uh, as Jesus did, there's an interesting quote in Desire of Ages 641. Love to man, or to woman, or to humanity, is the earthward manifestation of love of God. It was to implant this love, to make us children of one family, that the King of glory became one with us. And when his parting words are fulfilled, love one another as I have loved you, John 15, 12, when we love the world as he loved it, then for us, his mission is accomplished. We are fitted for heaven, for we have heaven in our hearts. Mm. Very good. That's what this is a call to. Mm -hmm. Well, Paul goes on to expand the concept in in the verses we just read. uh, And you can compare back to verses, chapter 3, verses 11 to 13. There are four different words used in Greek for love. What we call, we typically are translated love into English. Epithumia is a word used to describe um, passion. It, it doesn't always mean love. It sometimes can be hate or, or other, but it's, it's, it's emotional passion. Um, eros is specifically refers to a sexual kind of love. Philos is a word used to describe filial or family love, and of course we should immediately think of Philadelphia, love for our brothers, the city, city of brotherly love. Agape, however, is the word most commonly used for love in the New Testament. It refers to principal love, which is not based on feeling or impulse, but on a recognition of the fact that every other human being, like us, is a child of God. 
So you don't, I mean, the guy who's standing on the corner down there saying, you know, I want a dollar for a beer, and we may smile, and we may, or we may be disgusted even by his looks or whatever like this, but that person is still a child of God. Well, is it hard to learn real love? Where do we first learn about real love? From your, from your parents, okay. from the home. Yeah. yeah. That's why it's so hard for some kids. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This far from the Garden of Eden, is it a miracle that any of us still know how to love? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Pretty much, isn't it? Well, Paul goes on. Uh, yeah. But, but how, what's the process for, for getting to know that kind of love? I mean, if it's hard, what do we do to get it? Yeah. Um, you hope that your parents are Christians. As an adult. As an adult. Well, hopefully you, must, you might have learned it from your parents when I was a child, because that, that would be the normal. At least partially. Yeah, that would be the thing. As, as an adult, the only honest thing I know how to, to tell you is look at the scriptures, look at the life of Jesus, and practice. Even if you don't understand what all is going on, try doing living, now you're not going to do the miracles he did and so forth like this, but, but try thinking about how he related to people and so forth, and, and just practice doing it as you see Jesus did it and probably, see what happens. Probably that comment that says a thoughtful hour in, their li yeah. in the life of Christ, especially the closing, closing ones, would be come as close as to how to get it as any. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, Paul goes on to describe the kind of people Christians should not be or should be, I'm sorry, not sponging off of others, but living a quiet life, earning their own living and supporting themselves. Is it possible that there were some lazy, even disruptive individuals who had chosen to join the Thessalonian church? Were some or all the Thessalonian members living a sort of communal life, as we suggested a moment ago, where free meals were available? Or were some of the Thessalonian believers actually trying to depend upon Gentiles for their sustenance? Wouldn't that be something? Ellen White says these words in Acts of the Apostles, page 518. Those who would not fall a prey to Satan's devices must guard well the avenues of the soul. They must avoid reading, seeing, or hearing that which will suggest impure thoughts. And how much of that is there around us all the time? The mind must not be left to dwell at random upon every subject that the enemy of souls may suggest. The heart must be faithfully sentinelled, or evils without will awaken evils within, and the soul will wander in darkness. I think that's a pretty indicting picture of, of the world in which we live. Yeah, very true. And you wonder where, where we're ever going to go with this. The mind must not be left to dwell at random. Mm -hmm. So, what's the alternative? Well. You know, you know the old, and I don't know, this may have been another Ben Franklin, I don't know, <laughs> but he said, an idle mind is the devil's workshop. You probably all heard that expression at some time. Um, boy, it's true. So we can guard against this by perhaps having regular prayer times at meals, at bedtime, maybe a little scripture reading, mm -hmm. you know, daily with the family. I think it goes beyond that. And avoid, and avoid the things that we know yeah. are problematic. That, but I think we have to keep that same attitude that we have at those particular points in time with us all day long. Yes, yes. And, and my point was is we can do that, Conscious. but we need a, a regular pattern of Absolutely. living so that we can carry that throughout the day. Yeah. You know, there's some interesting background that many people are not aware of. There were never, Paul was a Pharisee. He says, I was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. I mean, you know, he's, by the time he's just barely old enough to, to, to teach others, he's like a member of the Sanhedrin. You know, you can't believe the progress this young man is making in the days before he became a Christian. Well, it turns out that there were never more than about 6,000 Pharisees at any one time. There's several reasons for that. First of all, in order to live those kind of very 
disciplined lives where you fast two days a week and you do all the other things you're supposed to do to be a Pharisee, you almost had to be independently wealthy, support yourself, I mean, from some other source, in order to do all those things. Well, Paul apparently was. So you couldn't be a slave and do that. You couldn't be a slave and be a Pharisee, that's for sure. Well, even within the Pharisees, there were groups. And I'm going to mention one of those very interesting groups that people chuckle about sometimes. Uh, they were called the bruised and bleeding Pharisees. There were about seven different groups of Pharisees. But the bruised and bleeding Pharisees were like this. The Talmud speaks of the plague of self-afflicting Pharisees. That's another word for the bruised and bleeding Pharisees. These Pharisees received their name for this reason. Women had a very low status in Palestine. Yoli, you talked about that. No really strict Orthodox teacher would be seen talking to a woman in public, even if that woman was his own wife or sister. I mean, you know, I'm a male. How can I talk to a lowly female in public, even if she's my wife or my sister? I don't know what would happen if it was your mother. These Pharisees went even further. They would not even allow themselves to look at a woman on the street. Some people have suggested they wear burqa kind of things completely covering their face. I don't know if that's true or not. In order to avoid doing so, they would shut their eyes and so bump into walls and buildings and obstructions. So a woman comes down the street, you've got to close your eyes, and even if you run into something, that's fine. But you, you don't want to see someone else's wife or someone else's sister or someone else, or maybe an available woman, because you might be tempted. They thus bruised and wounded themselves from running into things, and their wounds and bruises gained them a special reputation for exceeding piety. Was that, <laughs> by the way, that you can find, you can read more about that in William Barclay's The Daily Study Bible, his uh, comments on, on, on Gospel of Matthew, Volume 2. So, it takes more than a ritual of religious activity. Mm -hmm. Because there was nothing, no, no group of people more devoted to religious activities mm -hmm. than were the Pharisees, and they totally missed Jesus. Mm -hmm. So there's something else that has to be yeah. put into that formula that's, that's vital. Well, how many ways do we need to guard the avenues of the soul? Remember the quotation we read from Ellen White? Is it particularly true in the area of entertainment? I mean, think of the things that people regard as entertainment in our day. How many of them are sexually explicit or at least sexually Im implicit in one way or another? In, in the Greek, uh, perhaps you can help us, the word entertainment, doesn't that mean some type of uh, blank mind or hmm. an open blank mind in the Greek? I don't remember I running across that word in, in in the Bible. I'll have to work on that one. I'm, I'm not saying it correctly, but some mm -hmm. type of kind of mindless mm -hmm. watching. Yeah. So you've yeah. opened up your brain to... And what happens when we have the internet bringing the world into our private rooms? Well, every parent knows you never keep the computer in a, in a room, mm -hmm. you know, in a bedroom or something. It needs to be out in the living room, in the kitchen, where the whole family can be there. And it's not really the children's fault if they see something. They're just clicking on buttons. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned before, they could be in a, watching a religious service. You walk out of the room, you come back, <coughs> and it's like, how did you get here? You know, mm -hmm. they pushed a button. They don't have a TV, but they got a cell phone. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> now we can do anything on the cell phone. Yeah, hopefully on the Internet we get things like... Uh, more about God, more about the gospel. Mm -hmm. Well, by contrast, how do we grow more and more in the likeness of Jesus Christ? The process which is sometimes called sanctification. More specifically, how are we changed by beholding? And, and you know the famous quotation we've mentioned many times. It is by beholding that we become changed. Mm -hmm. And we become like what we worship and admire. So, what do we worship and admire? The, 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 the movie moguls? And what about, Paul was quite blunt in speaking about what he thought needed to be done to live a, a holy life. 
How do you feel about Paul's overall approach? Are we comfortable talking about sexual immorality? A lot of Christians feel like that's a taboo subject. You don't want to talk about it. But what about that? Do Christians need to learn to call sin by its right name? Yes. Well, what is it about sexual immorality, immorality that is so dangerous? What does it do to us as human beings? Would you describe our world as a, as, as a world of unbridled sexual lust and perversion? Pretty much, huh? Where does homosexuality fit into this whole picture? Well, in 2010, a study was done at Yale University. Now, that's one of the old Ivy League conservative institutions, right? Clearly, Yale is one of the most prestigious, prestigious universities in America. Of the other respondents, the people who responded to the survey, 71%, these are people, these are students at Yale University, 71% that their religious views did not at all affect their sexual behavior. Another 19% said their sexual behavior was only impacted slightly by their religious views, and only 10% felt that religion had a lot to do with their sexual behavior. What does this teach us, teach us about trends within America? Well, to, to comment again about how things were in Paul's day, here's a, something from the Word Bible Commentary. A man in Paul's day might have a mistress, Hatera, who could provide him also with intellectual companionship. The institution of slavery made it easy for him to have a concubine, a palace, while casual gratification was readily available from a harlot, what, what turns out to be our pornography. The function of his wife was to manage his household and to be the mother of his legitimate children and heirs. How much different are we than that today? Well, it's very clear that in the Old Testament, many of the saints had more than one wife or female companion. Specific examples included, of course, Solomon with his thousand, David with his many, many scores, even Abraham. We know his story. In light of these clear histories, what should we say to our young people about the necessity of having a monogamous relationship, one man and one woman? Can you make a compelling argument? Could you make a compelling argument for monogamy from the pages of Scripture? Is this something that the church needs to do more specifically? Certainly it's a need, and certainly it's something the church needs to you know, stand up and, and, and be counted for. We hope you've enjoyed our discussion. See you next week.